Hi, my name is John Schwartzman. Uh, I'm the cinematographer of Benny and June, uh, sometimes referred to as the director of photography. And what you're looking at actually is something that I haven't seen in a very long time, which are the original filter tests and, and hair and makeup tests for Benny and June. We actually combined all the tests um, into sort of one group of shooting because we only had the actors for one day. Typically, you might go out and shoot uh, filter tests on one day and then bring the actors in and spend a day or two with the makeup artist and then even another day with a costume designer. But in this case, uh, we were getting very close to the start of this film, and we decided that it would be best if we could combine everything. So what you're going to see are a lot of really boring shots of Johnny Depp, who plays Sam in the movie, uh, Aiden Quinn, who plays Benny, and Mary Stuart Masterson, who plays June. And you see here, there's a slate that says, uh, test clean. Uh, and there's a number on the side, which is the f-stop, uh, which you have on a still camera. That was the exposure that we set our motion picture camera at. And throughout these tests, you're just going to see different things kind of come by very quickly on the slate. It may say Mitchell A, or it may say rear net. Um, all of these are just different tools that uh, I will use as a cinematographer to affect the image. Um, you know, most people are pretty familiar with cameras these days. They have point-and-shoot cameras. Um, and But what you don't really explore is how can I manipulate the image other than just, you know, deciding whether or not to point the camera and, and record it. And, in, and in motion pictures, we're trying to create a mood and a feel and an emotion. And one of the tools that the cinematographer has, uh, in addition to lighting and and other things like camera movement is does he want to in some way affect the image with a filter in front of the lens and this was a test for us we wanted benny and june to sort of feel timeless we didn't want it to feel as though it was a period piece but at the same time we didn't want the images to be so sharp that you would think that it was automatically contemporary we just kind of wanted it to have a a fairy tale quality and this was just one of the things that Jeremiah, Chechik, and I were exploring as a, as a way to see what would look best to us. Ultimately, after we shot uh, about 20 minutes of film that you're going to see, we chose to shoot the entire picture with a Mitchell A, which is a very, very light amount of filtration. Here, it looks like we have something fairly heavy on the lens. Here's a rear net with an eighth black promise, which means we put a piece of net, which is like a, a woman's stocking, and actually stretch the material over the lens, uh, behind the, the lens, which are interchangeable on motion picture cameras, and then put a filter in front of the lens, which uh, is sort of like a piece of glass smeared with Vaseline, and it gives the, the image this sort of soft and diffused quality. Um, the other thing we were looking at is just the color of the wardrobe against the actor's skin. There's a lot of subtleties that go on that, that when you're watching a movie, you're probably not really aware of, which is if I dress uh, this actor in this color wardrobe, when I put the light on them, what happens when the light hits that piece of wardrobe and bounces on to their face? And if you notice the difference, there's a difference in the color of Mary Stuart Masterson's skin when she wears something blue versus when she wears something yellow. And it was just a case of trying to find which color seemed to suit her best. She obviously, as, as the lead actress, had ideas as well, and we were all trying to sort of narrow down from a very wide range of palettes what we thought would be the best. The other thing you'll notice is sometimes the images will be lighter and darker. And what you're trying to find out is what ratio, what contrast ratio each actor's face really likes to take. And what we would do is, and when I say contrast ratio, what I really mean is the measurement of the amount of light on one side of her face versus the other. Do we use half the amount of light on the dark side of her face? Do we use a third the amount of light on the dark side of her face that we do on the bright side of her face? And it was always, you know, it was always sort of a struggle as to, you know, how mysterious do we keep these characters? Um, and, and ultimately, you sort of start with a ratio where the face is evenly lit, which I find sort of uninteresting because there's no shadows, and work your way down to where you put no light on the other side of the face, and you end up getting a face that's sort of half in light and half in shadow. 
ultimately, I don't I don't know what I'm looking at now in terms of what the contrast ratio is, but this was sort of the world in which we lived in for Mary Stewart. It just seemed to sort of fit her well, and I thought she looked really beautiful in this movie, and I felt very proud of, of the way she came off. Um, and I think she was very happy as well. Um... Uh, just to give a little background on what a cinematographer does, um, ultimately it's a, the director's in charge of the movie. He's a, he hires everybody, and he decides ultimately where the camera's going to go and how the actors are going to act. It becomes his responsibility. He's he's sort of like the general. The buck stops with him. Now, what a good director does is he hires uh, a good editor, a good production designer, a good cinematographer, a good costume designer, people that he can trust to help deliver his vision. Uh, in this case, the director, Jeremiah Chechik, and I had worked together uh, probably for about two years doing commercials. So we had a, we had a pretty good understanding of each other. There wasn't a... We didn't have to spend a lot of time getting to know each other. Uh, we were friends pretty much from the get-go. So that, that enabled us to work at a fairly refined level very quickly. And I, I knew what his tastes were, and I knew what he liked to do. So, you know, it really my responsibility on Benny and June was to physically pull off the uh, vision that Jeremiah wanted to do, which sometimes meant that all I had to do was set the camera up. In, in other situations, it meant that if he wanted it to be a sunny day that day or we had decided we wanted it to feel like late afternoon and it was, uh, and it was a rainy day, it would require a lot of work and all the resources that I would have on my truck to create the feeling that the sun was streaming in through the windows. And... Ultimately, my responsibility is everything that you see before you. I'm in charge of taking a script, which is 120 pages or somewhat of that length of paper, and turning it into uh, a movie, uh, 10,000, 11,000 continuous feet of film, which you see, you know, ultimately projected in your theater or, in this case, on a laser disc. What we're looking at here are some day exterior tests. Again, the same day, different colors, uh, different qualities of light, and different filters to decide if we wanted to make the light a little more golden on the exterior. Um, again, here's a, and here's Aiden Quinn, and this is uh, our first interior test with him. And, and what you'll see with Aiden is that we wanted to play Aiden a little moodier and a little darker, so we used much less fill light. And you can see there's actually someone who's at my gaffer who is in charge of the electrical department, turning the light on and off. And, uh, and that's how we sort of vary the amount of shadow that we want to see on his face. Um, getting, getting back to the sort of the responsibility of the cinematographer, it's, it's, it's different in every movie. In this case, uh, it was really, I was trying to create a, a sort of a fairy tale so that these actors could could perform in this world that you that felt comfortable to you. You never really knew where you were or what time it was, but it also didn't matter. You just sort of bought it. And the idea was that the light felt real natural, that it was familiar, that when you, when people walked into a room, it just felt as though you were sort of uh, being a voyeur, that the light was naturally sort of coming in through the window, and that you really didn't feel the presence of a of a lot of technique there. Uh, you know, there are, there are plenty of movies like the Terminator movies where the, the sort of technical aspect of that film is almost more overwhelming than the film itself. The idea in Benny and June was to make it really pretty, but at the same time invisible. When Jeremiah and I sort of got together to do this movie, Jeremiah had talked about really wanting this movie to be real and authentic. So he decided that he was going to sort of take a trip around uh, the northwest of the United States. He he had a fantasy that this is where Benny and June were from and ultimately found Spokane, Washington, which was uh, a really interesting uh, city to photograph in. It really had never been had been shot before, and it had a really sort of interesting working class look. It had... Uh, uh, more trains than any place I've ever seen. Apparently, that's where they do a lot of uh, work on repairing huge train engines. So there were always trains moving in the background, and it had a had a really interesting feel to it. it was, it's it's on the very eastern edge of the state of Washington, very close to Idaho. And we basically worked mainly around practical locations and uh, tight spaces. As you can see, 
this house here, which ultimately is Benny and June's house, uh, and June Studio were June Studio was built right there on the edge of a river, which you know provides all kinds of technical problems uh, because you just don't have that much control. But Jeremiah was very insistent on it being real. So that that made Benny and June a, a, a very challenging movie for me because although to you it may seem like you're watching a sequence that happens in 90 seconds of time, it may have taken us two days to do that. But what you can't see in that 90 seconds is that the sun has come up on the eastern side and it is now setting in the west and it's done that for a day and a half because the reality of the drama of the scene is that it's happening in, in its own real 90 second time. So one of the real challenges as, as a cinematographer is that you maintain that consistency. That when you go outside, you may start at 7 o'clock in the morning and you may not finish till uh, 6 o'clock that evening. But it's got to feel like whatever time it is supposed to be in the movie. And, and one of the things that the script supervisor does in the film is she goes by and says each scene should happen at a specific time of day. So it may be that the scene that you're doing, uh, which is Sam outside the video store waiting to go in to get a job, is supposed to happen at 11 o'clock in the morning. But maybe you don't even show up there till 2 o'clock that afternoon and you're not going to finish that scene until the sun goes down. So one of the challenges that I have to deal with is, okay, how do I schedule my day? How do I give the director the shots that he needs to tell this scene dramatically in a way that I can also do that will maintain the visual integrity of the scene? And that's one of the big differences in working on films versus working on commercials. And Jeremiah and I have both done a lot of commercials together, and, and really commercials are about... Uh, three or four seconds of the most beautiful light you can create or find, but you don't have to maintain that continuity. There's actually one sequence in Benny and June, which is one of the most beautiful and probably the one that I get asked by more people how it was done, which is the scene with Benny, June, and Sam as they're walking away from the park after Sam has done his sort of magic trick to uh, to everyone's surprise. And it's a shot of, of Benny sitting on a park bench with all this golden light dancing off the river. And uh, it was one of these days, again, uh, where the weather was not cooperating with us. It had started out sunny, and it had been raining, and then it had gotten sunny again, and I was pulling my hair out, and Jeremiah was screaming at me to get the day's work done. And in addition to finishing this park sequence, I knew we had to do the tag to that scene, which was those guys walking away. And ultimately, there was a, a merry-go-round across the river, and the sun had actually gone down. It was about 9.30 at night. We're very far north here in this part of Washington, so there was still plenty of light in the sky, and there was this beautiful golden light dancing off the river. And uh, that was one of those scenes where we took every camera we had and did it all at once and didn't really worry about continuity. What you're seeing here actually is some speed tests that we were doing because um, in preparation for this movie, Johnny Depp spent a lot of time uh, watching Buster Keaton films. He spent actually about like, I think he spent six weeks researching Buster Keaton and Charlie Chaplin and a lot of the great silent film stars. And one of the things that the silent film stars did was that they played with camera speeds as a way to influence the way their stunts would come off. Uh, I mean, especially in the in the days of the silent films, you know, the stunt technology is not what it is today. Uh, so those people were true circus performers. I mean, they were really doing those stunts. Buster Keaton really did the kind of stunts that he did, and Charlie Chaplin did those. Uh, so what we were trying to do was see if by doing what they had done in the 20s, by altering our camera speed, we could in some way sort of give Sam's uh, Keaton-esque features a bit of extra magic. Uh, normally, a motion picture camera runs at 24 frames per second. You film it at 24 second, frames per second, and you run it back at 24 frames per second, and that feels like real time. In other words, if as long as you play back at the same speed you record, everything happens in real time. And what you're seeing here are slates that say 22 frames per second. So what we've actually done is we're shooting the camera at a slightly slower speed than we're playing it back, which effectively speeds up his motion. But not so much that it that it looks obviously speeded up. It just sort of subtly gives him his movement a little more freneticism. Um, 
When we ultimately went and did the movie, we shot his stuff at normal speed. I think the first day we did some stuff with Johnny, we shot it at two speeds, but then we decided that really he was so talented and his movements were so believable and so fluid that we didn't have to really go ahead and and screw around with the camera speeds. It was really more a case of less is more, which is really one of the truest things about Benny and June altogether, which was my my idea was to really try to stay out of out of the actor's way as much as I could, that I, I wanted to create visually the world for them to perform in, but to be very invisible. And, and I think we succeeded very much on it. I mean... Um, I think it's it's an it's a it, the photography helps tell the story, which is which is something that you try to do as a cinematographer. One of the uh, interesting things actually about doing Benny and June was that uh, Jeremiah had taken me aside in the beginning and said, "Look, if we stay on schedule, the studio will leave us completely alone, and we can do anything we want." Which led to uh, you know a few sort of unique things that we did on this movie. One of them was that um, there's a sequence, uh, it's actually a montage sequence, and it's after June has left the house and had her breakdown on the bus, and she's in the hospital, and Benny has come to see her, but she's turned him away, and he's walking through a train yard. And Jeremiah had always envisioned this sequence as uh, nighttime with rain and real moody and trains moving all around, and sort of this really beautiful sequence that I was really excited about filming. And ultimately, like a lot of things in the movie, you start to get towards the end and you don't have as much money and you start to become creative. And we were actually going to lose that sequence because we didn't really need it to tell the story and we didn't have the money to do it the way that Jeremiah wanted to do it. So I had come up with the idea of let's shoot it day for night. They used to do it all the time in the westerns. We don't need any lights. We don't need we won't have any rain, but we'll make it look like nighttime, even though it's the middle of the day. So we went to the train yard. And that's why that sequence, you can't, it doesn't look like night, but it doesn't look like day. It has a sort of otherworldly feel. And that was just, um, you know, taking a chance and sort of uh, going for it and trying to bring a little bit of the, you know, old techniques of filmmaking back into this. One of the other things that we did was the entire hospital in Benny and June is 1L. It is a, it was a 60 foot corridor that made a right turn and went another 120 feet. And what we would generally do is uh, we would shoot it as the first floor in the morning and then the art department, while well, the crew was at lunch, would change all the doors and all the uh, elevator signs to say the third floor. Uh, and suddenly it was the th third floor. And we had this whole entire map drawn out that we had pasted on the back of one of the set walls so that we would never get lost because the, we had this thing where you could only go uh, like counterclockwise around this set because if you went the other direction, you got lost as to where you were because basically they would go down the hallway, make a right turn, and then we would pick them up again at the end of the other hallway and it became the sort of like infinite you know, set. But it was a very creative way to use a, a limited amount of resources. And I think that that was really one of the ingenious things that Jeremiah really brought to Benny and June was... You know, I, I don't need to uh, to have an entire huge hospital to do this. This is what I need to tell this story. These are the elements, and this is how we can make it work. And I think that caught the spirit of the entire crew because Jeremiah was not afraid to take chances, and therefore all the way down the line, everybody else sort of carried that spirit throughout the film, and I, and I, and I hope it shows. I, I certainly feel proud of my work on it, and I think uh, everyone associated with it probably feels the same.